you a fan of this podcast? Do you wish there was even more juicy content for you to sink your ears into? Well, there is. You can become a premium member of this podcast for $5.99 a month and get full access to an archive of over 50 bonus episodes. Additionally, we release a bonus episode every single month. That's a ton of extra content, including my personal interior design diaries, extra tips, my talking about trends, and so much more. Additionally, you'll be keeping us on the airwaves each and every week because your premium membership money goes directly back to making this podcast amazing. Check us out at affordableinteriordesign.com, click on podcast to learn more and to become a premium member today. need a high-end designer or a lot of money to get a luxe look be your own interior designer this is affordable interior design the podcast here's your host betsy Hellman. before i dig into today's mailbag i just wanted to tell you about a project that i'm working on so we have a teen center in town and what is so cool about this teen center is it's only for middle schoolers so only grades six through eight can actually attend the events the movie nights the uh, all sorts of things gaming nights trivia nights all of that but also the programming the after school classes or workshops or different kind of fun things that they offer are taught by the high schoolers. So the high schoolers determine the curriculum. It's what the high schoolers are passionate about. They run the cafe, collecting the money. They can even earn money by teaching a semester's worth of these sessions. Like my son takes video gaming. He's taken like Minute to Win It, which are different kind of mini Olympic style competitions. There's improv, there's art, there's acting, there's debate, there's Dungeons and Dragons, all these different things. And the offerings change by semester based on which high schoolers are available and which high schoolers are more excited about what programs. There's like a sign language program, just depending, right? And so it's a great way for the high schoolers to make money and mentor these middle school kids. And the middle school kids feel like they have this really exclusive clubhouse, right? Where only they're allowed to be no elementary school kids, no parents, minimal adults, because it's all kind of facilitated by these high schoolers. Well, the place is a nonprofit. So it has taken in a lot of donations over the years. And the furniture is kind of a mishmash. There's Christmas lights mixed with LED lights, mixed with like a lot of rustic style furniture, mixed with overstuffed leather sofas and antiques because, you know, Connecticut's just rife with antiques. And it's kind of catch as catch can. And that is not just an experience that I see when I'm looking at these kind of community spaces that are taking donations and just say yes to whatever comes along and seems to fit kind of whatever Band-Aid they need at the time, whether it's more storage so they accept an old antique armoire or whether it's more tables so they take a whole bunch of mismatched cafe tables, different shapes, sizes, heights, ugh right? But it's also a problem that I see a lot in apartments or people who move to their first home and are on a limited budget because oftentimes they'll accept these handouts from whoever, right? Or if you're in the city, you find something cool on the street. Ooh, that'll work. I actually need more book storage. Let me take that small three shelf bookcase. Oh my gosh, it fits some of the books, so not all the books. So I'm looking for something else. Oh, look, my neighbor Sally from across the hall is moving out. I'll take her wire metal shelves. And then your home starts to look like this mishmash. And you haven't laid out an intention. First of all, not an intention for the style that you're willing to accept, but also an intention with the floor plan. I don't have room for all these craptastic free pieces. And 
even if you are in the phase where you're willing to or need to accept only donations because you don't have money, you still need a filter that still, you still need to say no sometimes, right? Does this fit my style requirements in terms of two word phrase or a mood board or whatever you want to do to stay really focused stylistically? And then does this fit the functionality? I've created a floor plan in advance of the things I'm looking for or want, and I'm not just going to slap a whole bunch of Band-Aids in this space. I'm going to wait and find the right armoire that has enough space. Or I'm going to ask specifically friends and family, do you have a tall bookcase instead of accepting two or three low shelves, right? These are the kinds of things that you must do in order to save these donated spaces from becoming disgusting, just amalgamations of everything and people's dumping ground. Because once they hear that you take things, whether it's donations or whether it's, you know, discarded furniture, you're bound to get more because the people who are giving you more people who are donating these things to you, they know something that maybe you don't. And I'm going to let you know right now what that is. What they know that you don't is that it's very easy to get things and very hard to get rid of things. Now, sure, you may have a pickup truck. You may have garbage pickup on the corner, right? It might be very easy for you in theory. But once something gets absorbed into the vortex and starts taking on some functionality, it's going to be very hard to extract it, to clear it off, to find something else that fits better, to do all these things. It's just easy to go with what's already there. So taking things in your space is something that's a little too easy to do. And getting rid of it is something that's surprisingly hard to do. And in places like a city, it's also very logistically hard. We don't have access to a pickup truck. A lot of times the garbage people won't take anything bigger than X, Y, Z. We get fined if we put out anything too large on the sidewalk. The super gets furious, all these different dynamics. So just because it's easy doesn't mean that you should take it because there is hardship down the road. And then it makes your space, well, let me just say, when a space looks nice and feels nice, people respect it more and they treat it with more of that sense of respect and reverence. Even yourself in your own space, when you look around and everything's mismatched, when you didn't personally invest much in those pieces, whether it's an emotional investment of saying, oh my gosh, it's perfect. I love it. It's what I've been waiting for. Or whether it's a real financial investment, sometimes we just don't treat it the right way. So my advice to you is to be really intentional with the style of the space and the layout of the space. And one thing that I want to say, too, is this is specific to the teen center. So I think it might help other people working in similar environments like basements or rec rooms. But let me just lay something out. So because the programming of this teen center changes every semester, they want this to be a very flexible space because one semester, this room is going to be for D&D and card playing. And the next semester, it's going to be for jewelry making. And the next semester, it's going to be for improv. Right. But this space is quite large and it has, I don't know, um, maybe seven different rooms and spaces. So they say, Betsy, I want it to be totally flexible. I want us to be able to totally change on a dime what we're doing, etc. And I think that that's a problem. I told them as much because, you know, I'm pretty brutal. They didn't know. I'm new to this community. They had no idea what they were getting into when they roped me in to give my advice as a donation. Uh, But the thing is, you have to teach people how to treat you. Got that from Dr. Phil. So if somebody's not treating you right in your life, you're allowing it, right? Or maybe even encouraging it with your behavior. Same with the space. You know, you teach people how to treat that space. So even though we may not want to label this room the Dungeons and Dragons room because we don't know what's going to take place next semester, maybe it's always table and chairs activities. 
Maybe it's the homework space. Maybe it's Dungeons and Dragons sometimes. Maybe it's, you know, crafts that take place on a table. But the core vibe of this room will always be table and chairs, seated activity, not too loud. Okay. And then we could name the space as much. We could put the intention on the door, right? Uh, but then in the next room, adjacent, maybe we keep it more open with just a few bean bags, with, um, you know, really like a soft spot for your feet so that it could turn into a dancing space. It could be an improv space. It could be a yoga room, but we could call it like the movement space. And no matter what type of movement is taking place that semester, the energy in the room and the core layout or intention of the room would never change. So we teach people how to use this room because they came to me and they said, Betsy, we have these seven rooms and three of them, nobody even go in, right? Three of these rooms, we want them to be spaces where the kids just gravitate and hang or gravitate and come do their own art projects or whatever, but nobody's really going into them. And my answer was people don't know what to do with them. You haven't set the intention for this is the quiet space for reading. This is where we're going to do gaming. And there's always going to be a headset set up. But when we decide one semester not to do gaming, it can be our computer lounge, right? So setting out some core intentions for how you're going to treat the space, whether or not the exact function stays the same for me, is essential in order to design a space that doesn't feel like it's trying to be all things to all people, right? Because we know as humans, when we try and be all things to all people, it doesn't work out. We wind up just exhausted and deflated and not intentional. Same thing with the space. When everything has to move around, when everything has to be like, I could be in this room or this room and I want to be on wheels and, you know, we could empty it or we could fill it and it depends on the semester. Where is all that stuff going? How is it impacting the other rooms? And what are people supposed to expect when say that room is empty? They're going to be afraid to use it. Like, what is this even? So that's just a project I'm currently working on and some obstacles that I feel need to be ironed out before I suggest any furniture, right? Let's teach people how to use this space. Now let's get into the mailbag and teach people how to treat your space. And now it's time for a quick commercial break. Do you love this podcast? Do you wish you could learn even more? Well, we have an online class bundle. Our online class bundle is comprised of three online classes, Beautifying Your Home for Less, Styling Your Home, and The Fundamentals of Feng Shui. Each one of those three classes is between 30 and 45 minutes long and chock filled with visuals and tips, things that will help you to style your own space or help out with other spaces. Additionally, with the pack of three classes, you get an autographed copy of my book, Affordable Interior Design. You get all of that for only $99. Once again, that's the three online classes as well as the book for only $99. You just go to affordableinteriordesign.com slash classes. Once again, affordableinteriordesign.com slash classes to buy your bundle today. And if one of those classes sounded intriguing, but maybe you already have my book or some of the other topics are not of interest, you can buy the classes individually at that site as well. Each class is $40. So head over to affordableinteriordesign.com slash classes to get your bundle or your online class today. My first question comes from Kelsey and she's writing from Pittsburgh. She writes, Hi, Betsy. My family of four lives in a small ranch that is tight on space. We're in a season with little to spend on interior design, but I would love your recommendations. I don't feel my space well represents my personal style anymore. I'm trying to make the most of it now and also dream of upgrades that I can make in the future. The entirety of the general family space includes a couch area, which is pictured, that is just to the left of our front door. Our dining table is on the other side of the fireplace. This leads to a mostly empty small room that holds our piano and sliding doors to the outside. And this leads to the kitchen. 
my kids are three years old and three months old, so you'll see lots of toys in the corner. My question is a general one. When I'm looking at this space, what sticks out to you? Would you rearrange the space? Would you replace one or two things that are making it look outdated? It feels like a hodgepodge, and I'm not sure what to change first. I just bought the rattan shelving piece at an estate sale, and I love it. But I'm not sure it goes with anything now that I see it in the space. Do you have thoughts? How do I make this space make more sense and work better? I will note that the armoire is actually a liquor cabinet and craft cabinet as our TV is in the basement. If we replace the armoire, we will need some storage. All right, so let's dig in, Kelsey, because looking through your pictures, the space does feel relatively unintentional. Now you're asking for my first impressions. And this space is not too big, and it's kind of an open L shape for those of you listening and not viewing on YouTube. And we've got a sectional, we've got the small rattan shelving unit. It's really not that big or imposing. It's probably four feet high by two feet wide. We've got a small table and chairs set up. We've got that armoire for crafts. And then we've got a piano. So that's all in a relatively small L-shaped space, as well as a fireplace. It does feel tight and cramped. It does feel, because there's so many pieces floating in the space, whether it's the dining table and chairs, the armchair, the coffee table, everything feels unanchored. And when you have an open space, it's really important, well, an open multifunctional space, I should clarify. When you have an open multifunctional space, it's really important to define your zones, to visually show people where one area ends and the other area begins. And the very best way to do that, in my opinion, is with rugs, area rugs. Now you have the big problem of the magic carpet ride under the coffee table. You have a circular flocati under your wood and wire coffee table. We definitely would define that living zone with a nice big rug that would go fully under the length of the sofa and extend out into the room and create that living zone. But when I'm designing a room, as you heard maybe on last week's episode, I start first by creating the floor plan, and I use a very specific system, so I never on the podcast share what people should do in terms of exactly how their furniture should be placed because I use a systematic process, dropping everything in a drafted floor plan to make sure that the zones are in the right space. I try everything, leaving no stone unturned before I lock things in. So I highly recommend that you play with some different arrangements, whether you know a software system or whether you just want to use some graph paper. But this room is so tight that you really can't afford to mess up spatially. So you want to be strategic. You want to get the right size rugs for the right size placement for these things. So first thing, check your layout. Second thing, you've introduced this rattan shelf. And yes, it doesn't seem to go with the current pieces here. Now, again, you mentioned that you're on a budget. I am worried that you may be taking in low cost items or taking in these donations that are sort of mismatched because you're feeling like you're on such a budget rather than being intentional. This is a trap because we're starting to deviate from a well-defined style and it's starting to look a bit like a garage sale or a curiosity shop rather than an intentional space. So I do want you to come up with that two-word phrase. And I do want you to come up with a specific color palette derived from an inspiration piece. Those are things that I think this room is lacking that will help you decide what to take in and what to turn away. Okay, so once you've created the floor plan, selected the inspiration piece, and have your two-word phrase in place, then you are ready to make some changes. And some changes will need to be made. Yeah, I, hmm, I think the floor plan is really the first place to go, Kelsey. Uh, and just offhand, you know, I do think it looks a little jumbled, like there's a floor lamp next to the armoire. There's a floor lamp next to the sectional. 
Um, the floor lamp next to the sectional seems quite intentional, but the floor lamp next to the armoire just, I don't typically put a floor lamp that has a broad shade next to a piece that's not seating, right? So I might have been more inclined to do like an arcing lamp over the table or something like that. But again, it's all predicated on do we have the right layout? And we certainly don't have anything driving this color palette. Now, I love the pop of blue with these dining chairs. And I love the rustic direction that some of these things are in. So I feel like you already have sort of an inkling of a style, but you're just not committing to it because the armoire is very transitional with its crown on the top and its shaker door front. I might even recommend, because it sounds like you're crafty, painting this piece because there's so much brown in the room. The piano's brown, the bench is brown, the flooring's brown, the table's brown, the armoire is brown, the armchair is brown, and the rattan shelving unit, as well as one of the floor lamps, all brown as is the top of the coffee table. So I think we're on a one-way trip to Brown Town here and we need to break it up. And while I do not typically recommend painting furniture, I do think that painting this armoire, if you are crafty and do it the right way, meaning sanding and everything like that, will really make this piece feel more fresh and could fit in in a variety of styles depending on the color you paint it. So this is a direction that I want you to start going down. Now, once you've committed, Kelsey, to both the floor plan and to a color palette or that two-word phrase, I want you to write me back with these exact same images, but maybe moving the pieces where you've decided that they need to go ultimately. Because then I will have that guidepost that I can look at and say, oh, this is where we're going. Clearly, I can offer help in this way. But right now, I feel like you're just at the beginning of your journey and everything's a little bit lost. One other thing I like to say to my clients is get the plants out of there. Plants are just additional clutter until you've created that perfect layout. Because one of these plants looks a little bit dead. The other one is thriving, but kind of an odd size for where it's placed. And then you have some dried fronds on the mantle. And right now it's just visually cluttering the space, but really it's the ones that I'm concerned about that are taking up floor space that you're like, oh, I need a place for this plant. Forget about plants until the primary pieces are placed. Then see where we can fill in with plants in areas that get good natural light. So one thing to cross off your function list or to not consider when you're doing your floor plan are those plants for right now. But don't worry, plant lovers. Once you've got that floor plan in place, we can drop them back in in places that make sense. Okay, Kelsey, a little more homework before I'm able to guide you specifically, but I think I've given you some good initial work that you can certainly dig your teeth into and that will also make a huge impact in this room. So guys, when you're designing, think strategically. Even if you're on a budget, don't accept everything that comes your way. And then your room will really behave the way you want to because you're treating it Teach people the way, well, you know, you know what I'm saying. The Dr. Phil thing, right? Go back to Dr. Phil. When all else fails, go back to Dr. Phil. I've got baby brain, but with baby brain, I can still design. I can design in my sleep, people. So send me your questions. Go to affordableinteriordesign.com slash podcast. Once again, affordableinteriordesign.com slash podcast. And once I do start sleeping again, well, then I'll be designing in my sleep. But until then, I'll just be waiting here by the mailbag waiting for your questions. Until next week. Bye, everybody. You've asked for it, and we have answered the call. For years, you've been saying, Betsy, you're talking about all these great design concepts, but we can't visualize them. You're describing the picture that the listener sent in of their problem, and we wish we could see that picture too. After all, a picture is worth a thousand words, and I do my best to describe them, but there's nothing like seeing it for yourself. 
And that's why Affordable Interior Design, the podcast, now has a YouTube channel. Not only do we have a YouTube channel where you could see recordings and clips of these podcast episodes, we also have an Instagram, a Facebook, and so many other exciting things. You should check it out. Head over to affordableinteriordesign.com slash links. Once again, affordableinteriordesign.com slash L-I-N-K-S links. And when you go there, you will see links to our YouTube page, our Instagram page, our Facebook page, and more. Please check it out, follow and subscribe so you can see everything I'm talking about. A big thank you to our amazing producer, Catherine Heller, to Aton and the MDCR House Band, and to Affordable Interior Design, the sponsor of this podcast and the premier place to get an amazing look on a budget. Check out affordableinteriordesign.com. If you guys love the show, the very best way to support us is by spreading the word. Tell your friends or write us an awesome review on iTunes. So until next week, guys, thanks so much for joining us, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.